Let's begin by addressing the upcoming hearing scheduled for October 16, where the focus will be on Jack Smith and his team's request to impose certain limitations on the speech of former President Donald Trump and his legal representatives. The expectation is that Judge Lisa will, to some extent, impose restrictions on Trump's speech. However, these limitations may not be as extensive as what prosecutors had hoped for. One key aspect that was brought to the judge's attention during this process was Trump's visit to a gun shop. Prosecutors highlighted this incident to underscore their argument that Trump frequently makes inflammatory statements on social media and then attempts to backtrack through his spokespersons. This tactic was exemplified when Trump's spokesperson, Stephen Chung, initially stated that Trump had purchased a gun, only to retract that statement shortly thereafter, claiming that he didn't actually mean what he said. Prosecutors drew parallels between this incident and other instances where Trump made provocative statements, such as if they come for me, I'm coming for them, or similar declarations. Their intention was to demonstrate that Trump is using his campaign as a shield while disseminating increasingly incendiary rhetoric into the public sphere. Now, let's shift our focus to the New York fraud trial, which is set to commence on Monday and is currently slated to continue through December. This behavior could potentially undermine the fairness of the trial. It's worth noting that this trial schedule was established before Judge Arthur and Goran granted summary judgment in favor of the Attorney General on her primary claim. This claim asserted that Trump, along with his co-defendants, engaged in a persistent pattern of defrauding individuals in the financial markets, including their own lenders and insurance companies. They achieved this by presenting grossly inflated valuations of Trump's various assets. Given the recent developments, it remains uncertain whether the trial will extend for the originally anticipated duration. However, it's crucial to mention that Donald Trump and his adult children are not only included on their own witness list but also on the Attorney General's list of witnesses. Trump has expressed his commitment to being present in the courtroom during the proceedings on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. This presents an intriguing dynamic as it's challenging to claim unavailability when you are the former president and a key figure in the courtroom proceedings. Shifting gears, we also observe the recent guilty plea in Fulton County, Georgia, by a defendant named Scott Hall. This development holds significant relevance because Hall's involvement spans various facets of the interconnected efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. One of the most striking aspects of his plea deal is its alignment with the charges against former Trump attorney Sidney Powell. Scott Hall's involvement in a scheme to break into election equipment in Coffee County, Georgia, raises eyebrows due to the timing. These break-ins occurred after January 6 and, in some instances, after the transfer of power to President Joe Biden. This suggests that those involved may have been seeking to gain insights into how Dominion voting machines operated. Such knowledge could have been leveraged to continue challenging the legitimacy of the election in other states, including Arizona, where audits were underway. Notably, Scott Hall also had interactions with other individuals, including a 63-minute phone call with Jeff Clark on January 2. This communication is likely to be of significant interest to prosecutors. As part of his plea agreement, Scott Hall has committed to full cooperation with prosecutors, including offering testimony. This development carries adverse implications for figures like Sidney Powell and Jeff Clark and, ultimately, could prove problematic for former President Donald Trump in ongoing election-related investigations.